Chapter 20, Caring for Muscle and Bone Injuries. Objectives, going to be defined the following. Anatomical position, angulated, blunt trauma, closed fracture, cravat, dislocation, manual stabilization, open fracture, position of function, sling, splint, sprain, strain, swath. Number two, describe the components that make up the musculoskeletal system. Explain the functions of the musculoskeletal system. Describe the major bones of the skeletal system. Describe the signs and symptoms of the musculoskeletal injury. Differentiate between a sprain, a strain, a fracture, and a dislocation. Differentiate between an open and closed skeletal injury. Explain the appropriate care for a patient with a skeletal injury. Explain the importance of an appropriate assessment of the distal extremity. Differentiate between directly and direct and indirect forces and the injuries they cause. Explain the criteria for placing an angulated extremity injury into an anatomical position. Explain the purpose and methods of manual stabilization of a skeletal injury. Explain the priority of care for a patient with a suspected open skeletal injury. Explain the priority of care for a patient with a multi-system trauma. Demonstrate the appropriate assessment of skeletal injury. Demonstrate the appropriate care for a patient with a long bone injury. Demonstrate the appropriate care for a patient with a joint injury. Demonstrate the appropriate technique for manual stabilization of a skeletal injury. Demonstrate the proper placement of an angulated extremity. Injury into an anatomical position. Demonstrate the proper placement of an arm sling. Demonstrate the prop the ability to place a hand foot in the position of function during immobilization of an extremity. Value the importance of body substance isolation precautions when caring for patients with musculoskeletal injuries. All right, musculoskeletal system. All right, so the musculoskeletal system includes the muscles, the bones, joints, connective tissues, blood vessels, and nerves. It's four major functions. Support, uh, that means supporting the entire body. Movement, protection, and cell reproduction. All right, this is the anatomy of the extremities. It includes your artery, your nerves, as well as your veins. Let's take a few minutes, a few seconds to look at this. It's also in your book. All right, skeletal systems, major divisions. You get your axial skeleton, which includes the skull, spinal column, sternum, and ribs. You got your appendicular skeleton, which includes the extremities. If you look at the two figures below, the appendicular skeleton is displayed on the figure to the left and the axial skeleton is displayed on the figure to the right. So appendicular is going to be the extremities. Axial is everything else. Alright, what does it mean to use an assessment based approach? Uh, it means that you need to approach the injury in a systematic way, just like we're doing patient assessment. Uh, we will go over specific trauma patient assessment when we're in class next week. Uh, what is the EMR's primary job in dealing with musculoskeletal injuries? Uh, primary job is going to be stabilization and preventing further injury. Uh, what can happen when blood vessels and nerves are injured? Um, so depending on the location of the blood vessel, the size of the blood vessel, you can have major bleeding, which can cause somebody to go in shock. If you've got large nerves involved, uh, you can have issues with going into shock as well. Uh, but remember the distributive shock or neurogenic shock causes the blood vessels to dilate. All right, appendicular skeleton. 
Uh, these are the bones that form the upper and lower extremities. Uh, upper extremities include the shoulder girdle, arms, and fingers. This table 20.1 just goes over the bones of the upper extremities. This is in your book. I'm not going to go over it right now. Figure 20.3 shows the bones of the upper extremities. Um, the image on the left hand side is the front or the anterior portion of the body. The image on the right is a view from the back or posterior. Just take a few seconds and look at these. It's also in your book. Our appendicular skeleton, lower extremity specific, includes the pelvis, the legs, and the toes. This is another table uh, showing the bones of lower extremities. This is in your book. Bones of lower extremities, uh, front view and back view. Extremity injuries. All right, causes of extremity injuries. Uh, first cause we want to talk about is the direct force. This is an external force uh, directly affects the body to cause an injury at the point of impact from a fall or striking of an object. Indirect force. This is injury of a force transferred up or down the extremity, resulting in injury farther along the uh, extremity. All right, so what's an example of an injury caused by a direct force? Uh, this would be somebody hitting someone else in the arm with a baseball bat and breaking a bone. Indirect force would be from a car striking a tree, your uh, foot pressing down into the floor of the car and then causing a fracture of the tibia, which is a bone in your lower extremity. All right, causes of extremity injuries, uh, twisting force. Uh, the body is going to remain stationary while the hand or foot continues turning. All right, uh, there are three basic uh, types of mechanisms of injury. You got an indirect force, a direct force, and a severe twisting force. All right, mechanism of injury is the force or forces that may have caused the patient's injury. Direct force is energy that is transmitted directly to an extremity, causing an injury at the site of the impact. An indirect force is the energy uh, from a direct force blow that is transferred along the axis of the bone and causes an injury farther along the extremity. Twisting force, the force is caused when an extremity or part of an extremity is caught in a twisting or circular mechanism while the rest of the extremity or body is stationary or moving in another direction. A downward blow, uh, this can generally affect the clavicle and scapula. Lateral blow, clavicle, scapula, and humerus. A lateral blow of the lower extremities, knee, hip, and femur. Indirect force is going to affect the pelvis, hip, knee, leg bone, shoulder, humerus, elbow, forearm bones. Twisting force affect the hip, femur, knee, leg bones, ankle, shoulder, elbow, forearm, and wrist. Force flexion or hyperextension. Uh, this is generally going to be at your large joints, including the elbow, wrist, fingers, femur, knee, or foot. All right, so you got some different types of injuries. First one we're going to talk about is a closed injury. Uh, this is going to be no break in the skin. Uh, this can also include if you're dealing with a injury to the head, an open laceration to the scalp while the cranium itself remains intact. You can have a soft tissue or an open injury. This includes soft tissues adjacent to the injury or damaged and open.
Full extent of the injury is determined through an x-ray. Do not try to diagnose the injury. Just treat the signs and symptoms. All right, figure 26 shows examples of closed and open fracture of the lower leg. If you got the closed injury, the skin is not broken. Open injury, you can see the bone is protruding through the skin. Fracture. Anytime bone is broken, chipped, cracked, or splintered. Dislocation. One end of a bone that is part of a joint is pulled or pushed out of place. Force of dislocation may cause a fracture of the adjoining bone. Sprain. Excessive twisting force causing cause limits and ten tendons to stretch or tear. Ligaments connect two bones to form a joint. Tendons attach muscle to bones. Strain is also caused by overexerting, overworking, overstretching, or tearing of a muscle. Angulated injuries or deformities. Uh, extremity is bulging, bent, or angulated where it normally should be straight. Major angulation may cause veins and disrupt blood flow. Patient may have decreased sensation or motor function. Uh, signs and symptoms of extremity injuries include pain, swelling, discoloration, deformity, inability to move a joint or limb, numbness or tingling sensation, loss of a distal pulse. All right, so what is the significance of the absence of a distal pulse? Uh, that could mean that you're not getting adequate perfusion to the distal tissues of the affected extremity. All right, so slow capillary refill, grating or crepitus, sound of breaking at the time of the injury. You may also have an exposed bone. All right, so what is a major risk of a bone that's exposed? Uh, it's going to be infection. Infections of the bone can become very severe and life-threatening. All right, patient assessment. Um, as it relates to trauma, you're going to assess injuries for adequate circulation, sensation, and motor function. Before and after immobilization, you want to do this, so you want to make sure nothing has changed. If you have a pulse before, you want to make sure you have a pulse after you splint it. Now, bleeding in the tissue presents a swelling and discoloration. When you're assessing your pulse points, it's a good idea to mark them. That way you know exactly where the pulse should be when you're reassessing afterwards. All right, so when you're assessing the injuries for adequate uh, circulation, sensation, and motor function, uh, when you're looking for signs of compromise, you may see no distal pulse. The extremity may be pale and cool. You may uh, present with cyanosis. Capillary refill time may be greater than two seconds. This is the image showing them assessing the capillary refill in the fingers. All right, so emergency care is going to be scene size up, scene safety, BSI, PPE, MOI, uh, which means you're going to consider the need for spinal precautions. You also need to get a total number of patients. Emergency care for this patient is going to include a primary assessment. Get a general impression of the environment and the patient. Determine if the patient needs to be moved and transported. Assess ABCs. Assess the mental status. Detect and correct uh, life-threatening problems. Care for skeletal injuries in the following order. Uh, you always want to care for the spine first. Uh, next is going to be the skull, rib cage, pelvis, thighs, and extremity injuries that have no distal pulse. Right, so again you want to take proper BSI precautions, perform a primary assessment, cut away clothing to expose the injury site, control bleeding if there is open wound. Alright, uh, check for distal circulation, sensation and motor function in expected, affected extremity. Immobilize extremity using manual stabilization or splints. Apply a cold pack or ice pack to the injury site to help reduce pain and swelling. 
administer oxygen per local protocol, assess the patient's vital signs, emotional support important when caring for a patient with musculoskeletal injuries. Here's a scenario. You are treating a young man who has been struck by a car. He has an angulated lower leg fracture. You ask her if her neck or back hurts and she says no. How reliable is this answer? The uh, answer is not terribly reliable because she has what we call a distracting injury. This angulated lower leg is going to cause extreme pain and it may mask pain she's uh, experiencing else, elsewhere in her body. Uh, you're going to proceed by treating her as if she has a more significant injury and you're going to go ahead and immobilize her on a long spine board. Splinting. Immobilization of the injury. Uh, any object that can be used to restrict the movement of the injury can be used as, as a splint. Uh, some examples would be a piece of wood, cardboard, or a folded blanket. Remember, as an EMR, you definitely want to um, improvise if you need to. Uh, so splinting is going to keep the injured extremity stationary, and you can cause for uh, prevent further damage to the blood vessels or nerves. Right, manual stabilization. Uh, you're going to use your hands to restrict the movement of the injured person or body part. This is just an image showing the provider providing manual stabilization of the injured extremity. All right, so splinting allows uh, repositioning and transfer of patients while minimizing the movement of the affected extremity. Compl uh, complications that can result from splinting include pain, damage to the soft tissues, bleeding, restricted blood flow, uh, closed injuries can also become open injuries. Uh, complications associated with extremity injuries can be prevented or decreased with splinting. Just take a look at your image here. It's got some labels that show some different things. General rules for splinting. Assess and reassure the patient. Expose the injury site. Control all major bleeding, dress open wounds, check distal circulation, sensation, and motor function before and after splinting. Splint injuries before moving the patient. Alright, um, have materials ready before you splint. Gently realign angulated limbs without distal circulation to anatomic position per protocol. Uh, you're doing this to possibly restore a pulse. Immobilize suspected fracture site and joints above and below the injury site. Sling and swath upper extremities. Secure lower extremities to each other. Uh, so if you've got a fractured leg you can use the other leg basically as a splint to keep everything straight all right you want to secure splints with cravats or roller gauze elevate the extremity minimize effects of shock by maintaining body temperature and providing oxygen per your local protocols or right, do only what you have been trained to and what is allowed in your EMS system if there is no distal pulse and the and skin distal to the extremity is pale or blue and cold, take action immediately to minimize po uh, potential permanent damage. Uh, that means you're going to try to realign the extremity into a um, more anatomic position. See if you can restore the pulse. Uh, do not force the limb if you meet resistance. Uh, if the patient complains of too much pain, stop. Apply a soft splint and elevate the limb by propping it on a blanket, <clears throat> roll, or pillow. Provide oxygen if you're able. Right, types of splints. You've got soft splints, uh, improvised, 
Uh, soft splints include pillows, blankets, towels. Uh, more common uh, soft splints are cravats, dressing, triangle bandage, sling and swath. Figure 20.3. It's just showing you how to do a sling and swath. Right, we're going to go over this in class. It'll be a good activity. Uh, but that's just basically making a sling and sloth using a triangle bandage. <clears throat> All right. Uh, rigid splints. They can be made of plastic, metal, wood, or compressed cardboard. Right, commercial splints are generally made of wood, aluminum, cardboard, foam, wire, or plastic. Inflatable splints, also known as air splints, are used for patients with injuries to the arm or lower leg bones. Uh, pneumatic pneumatic anti-shack garment or pass G. Uh, this is a special device used for splinting suspected pelvic and femur fractures. Check your local protocol. These are not very commonly used anymore. However, they still are in the national scope of practice. Improvised splints may be soft or rigid. They can be made from any material that will immobilize the extremity. This is a SAM splint. These are great. They're flexible. You can mold them to fit the arm. I we'll have some of these to play with in class. If you just notice, you can use it uh, for a variety of different injuries. Uh, was used on a forearm fracture in the previous slide. This was like a humerus fracture using the same splint for. And then this same splint can be used for a lower extremity as well. Very versatile. Right, you're treating a patient with a broken femur following a motor vehicle crash. Before you apply a traction splint, what other assessment elements would you consider? Why well, might taking the time to apply a traction splint in this situation be ill-advised? All right, so a patient with a broken femur uh, from a motor vehicle accident is going to have extremely high mechanism of injury. Taking a traction splint takes a long time to do, and applying one can delay transport, and it just may not be the most appropriate thing to do. When you've got somebody with that kind of mechanism of injury, you want to get off scene as quickly as possible. All right, management of specific extremity injuries. All right, apply rigid splints for injuries to the forearm and lower leg. Use soft or rigid splints for extremities to the arm, elbow, wrist, or hand. Use soft splints for injuries to the ankle or foot. Alright, this is a uh, figure just showing them applying a sling and a sloth in conjunction with another type of splint. And it just shows them placing a splint. This is showing how to splint a finger. Got what appears to be some type of uh, compressed wood splint holding the injured finger. And they've also got the other finger uh, attached to it. All right, upper extremity injuries. Uh, you're going to place the hand in a position of comfort. A roll of gauze in the patient's hand works great. Uh, your fingers are going to extend over the splint. Injuries to the shoulder, um, 
This can be a drop shoulder. The injured shoulder will appear to droop. Anterior dislocation. Shoulder joint bulging or protruding under the skin at the front of the shoulder. Slinging a sloth with padding between the arm and the chest is the most beneficial type of splint. Right, this is a uh, deformity caused by dislocation of the shoulder. If you look at the patient's left, you can see where the joint's protruding. Injuries to the upper arm, upper end, proximal, where the shoulder joint is formed. Right, this is basically going to be between your shoulder and your elbow. Uh, along the mid shaft of the bone, lower end, which is distal, where the elbow joint is formed. Uh, deformity key sign of injury to this bone. After controlling the bleeding, dress and bandage the open wounds to the injured extremity. Check distal circulation, sensation, and motor function before splinting. So you want to check your... Um, pulse, motor, and sensation before you splint. Select the appropriate size splint for the injury and pad the splint thoroughly. Firmly secure the splint, leaving the fingertips or toes exposed so you can monitor distal circulation, sensation, and motor function. After mobilization, reassess the distal circulation, sensation, and motor function. A lot of times it's referred to as PMS or pulse, motor, and sensation. It's a good idea to mark your pulse points. I uh, generally just use a Sharpie marker or a regular pen to mark the pulse point. All right, so you're going to elevate the extremity for an arm. Use a sling to immobilize it against the chest. For a leg, prop it on a pillow or a rolled blanket. If there is no indication of spine injury, injury to the elbow. Uh, joint formed by distal end of humerus and proximal end of radius and ulna. You're going to immobilize the elbow in a position in which it is found. Uh, don't try to move joints. Just mobilize it how it's found. Alright, so she's checking circulation, sensation, and motor function prior to splinting the elbow. Alright, they're using a commercial splint to mobilize the bone above and below which is going to mobilize the joint itself here she's applying a sling and a sloth swath to keep the uh, arm from moving she's rechecking circulation and sensation as well as motor function All right, you see the hand is in a position of comfort. She's got a rolled up piece of gauze placed in her hand. All right, so this is splinting an injured elbow in a straight position using a cardboard splint. Injuries to the forearm, wrist, and hand. The most effective splint is a rigid one. The patient uh, can be made comfortable with a pillow splint. Manuali manually stabilize the limb prior to splinting. Check for pulse motor and sensation prior to splinting. Apply a rigid splint to the limb. Place the limb in a sling and recheck circulation sensation as well as motor function. All right, this is them using a pillow to make a soft splint for the wrist and hand. Right, injuries to the finger. Not all injuries to the fingers require rigid splinting. Mobilize injured finger by taping finger to the adjacent finger. Use a tongue depressor or other rigid object. Right, this is a SAM splint. It's the same type of splint was used in the uh, other injuries again this is a flexible splint just note that they have two fingers in the splint probably only one of them is injured lower extremity injuries 
When the patient has multiple injuries or multi-system trauma, totally immobilize on long spine board or scoop stretcher. Be sure you have proper equipment and sufficient number of rescue personnel on hand to assist. Pelvic injuries can damage major blood vessels and internal organs. Pelvic girdle injuries may, may be managed with long spine boards, scoot stretchers, and blankets. Uh, Pass G or pneumatic anti-shock garment may be considered for immobilization. Check local protocol. Like I said, this has not been used in Georgia really for about a decade. You're probably not going to see any of these. I'll get some images of some we can look at in class. Right, anterior hip dislocation, the leg from the hip to the foot rotated outward uh, or laterally rotated farther than the uninjured side. Posterior hip dislocation, the leg is rotated inward or medially. The knee is also usually bent. Alright, so you can see they've got the patient's pants cut off. They're placing this device under the patient to mobilize the pelvis. They are wrapping the device over the top and pull until you hear the buckle click. This signifies the appropriate amount of pressure. Alright, like I said, this is a uh, SAM sling being applied to an injured pelvis. Uh, doubt we have any of those locally. You can do the same thing with a sheet. Right, lower extremity injuries, injuries to the femur can be life-threatening even when the injury is closed. Uh, bleeding inside the tissues can be severe. Most research says that in an average size adult, the uh, femur injury can produce up to 1,500 cc's of blood. High traction splints, these are mechanical devices that allow for application of constant traction of injured extremity. Uh, we'll play with one of these in class. Knee injuries, you will not be able to tell if the knee is fractured, dislocated, or both. Don't attempt to reposition the knee. All right, boot top injury. This is a transverse fracture of the tibia and fibula when a skier falls forward off of the t uh, ski tips. This is them assessing distal circulation. This is another image. She's assessing distal circulation sensation as motor function. The easy way to remember it is PMS or pulse motor sensation. She's applying rigid splints on either side of the limb. Put some padding over the bony projections of the limb. Secure the distal ends of the splints. All right, reassess distal circulation and sensation as well as motor function. All right, lower extremity injuries. Uh, provide care for injuries to the lower leg with rigid or soft splints. Rigid splints are used for injuries to the ankle or the foot. Soft splints are most comfortable for the patient. Immobilize in the position found. Do not try to reposition. Assess circulation, sensation, and motor function prior to splinting the extremity. Choose a splint that extends from the heel to well above the knee. Secure the splint above and below the knee and at the ankle. Reassess circulation sensation as well as motor function after the splint is secure. This is a mobilization of the lower leg using a towel. Just remember to improvise. Alright, you are treating a person who requires airway management, but he also has a severely bleeding open fracture of his leg. How would you establish the treatment prior to orties? <clears throat> 
under the circumstances in treat is treating the fracture important all right so you've got an individual with an airway issue uh, so that is going to be your top priority especially as far as your uh, assessment flow sheet reads you also have to keep in mind that a severely ble bleeding open fracture is very important this could be uh, some type of arterial bleed and they can lose a lot of blood if possible while you're managing the airway you need to go ahead and direct someone to address that musculoskeletal system uh, summary uh, you got muscle bones joints connective tissues blood vessels and nerves primary functions support movement protection and cell production bones of the axial skeletal system include the skull the spine the ribs and the skeleton and the uh, sternum the appendicular skeleton includes the upper and lower extremities signs and symptoms of musculoskeletal injury include pain swelling discoloration deformity strain this is going to be a stretching or tearing of muscle sprain is the partial or complete tearing of an limit ligament a fracture is a cracking or breaking of the bone dislocation the end of the bone is pulled partially or completely away from the joint open skeletal injury a broken bone end or bone fragments tear through the skin care includes assessment and monitoring patients ABC's and appropriate immobilization of the injury critical to assess circulation sensation and motor function of the extremities uh, distal to the extremity to determine if blood vessels or nerves may be damaged direct force injury at point where it impacted the body indirect force energy is transmitted from the point of contact to the different area of the body where it causes the injury if injured extremity is angulated it should be splinted in place if there is no distal circulation, the limb can be placed back into correct anatomical position with ease and without causing any significant pain for the patient. Skeletal injuries should be stabilized to prevent them from worsening. Uh, some uh, example of this would be to prevent a closed fracture from becoming an open fracture. All right, for an open skeletal injury, begin with the primary assessment as always. Expose the injury site. Control any excessive bleeding. Administer oxygen if applicable. Monitor the patient's vital signs until transport. Care for multi-system trauma. <clears throat> Assess and monitor ABCs. Assuming care for spine injury. Control any severe bleeding. Treat for shock. Coordinate for rapid transport. Uh, let's go over some review questions. All right, what are the components that make up the musculoskeletal system? Uh, so you've got muscles, bones, joints, connective tissues, blood vessels, and nerves. Uh, the major functions of the musculoskeletal system are support of the body, movement, protection, cell reproduction. Right, what are the major bones of the Skeletal system, uh, to be vague and brief, uh, your musculoskeletal system is going to include the bones of the axial skeleton as well as the appendicular skeleton. You can refer to your book for more detail on that. Signs and symptoms of uh, musculoskeletal injury are going to include pain, swelling, uh, loss of pulse, loss of sensation or motor function. <clears throat> All right, what is the difference between a strain, a sprain, a fracture, and a dislocation? A strain is going to be a tearing of the muscle. A sprain is going to be a partial or complete um, tearing of a ligament. A fracture is going to be a crack or breaking a bone. A dislocation is going to be a uh, bone being displaced from a joint. Now, what's the difference between an open and closed skeletal injury? Open skeletal injury, um, the bone or injured 
tissue has pierced the skin. A closed skeletal injury has not. How would you appropriately care for a patient with a skeletal injury? You're going to keep them in a position of comfort and attempt to splint the injured uh, body part. Why is it important to appropriately assess a distal extremity? Uh, you want to make sure they've got adequate pulse motor and sensation uh, prior to and after uh, splinting the individual. It's just very important. You don't want to cut off the circulation or impair anything else by splinting someone. All right, what is the difference between direct and indirect forces and the injuries they cause? Uh, so a direct force is going to be the force causing an injury direct, directly at the site of application of that force. Like I said earlier, this would be somebody that was struck with a baseball bat in their upper arm and they have a fractured humerus because of it. An indirect force would be um, a force applied to an extremity. Uh, the force travels up the extremity and causes the injury at a different place. For instance, a car wreck, your foot is pressed against the floor of the vehicle. The force is transmitted up the leg and you have a uh, fractured tibia, which is one of your main bones in your lower leg. Alright, so what are the criteria for placing an angulated extremity into an anatomical position? Uh, the only criteria that you're really going to look at is if they do not have a distal pulse, you may want to look at putting it in the anatomical position. Only do this if you don't have to force it and you're not causing any significant pain for the patient. All right, what's the purpose and methods used for manual stabilization of a skeletal injury? Uh, manual stabilization is generally going to be done with your hands. Uh, it is manually stabilizing that injury to reduce the movement when they're being moved. Right, what is the priority of care for a patient with a suspected open skeletal injury? Uh, you want to keep it clean is something really to think about. If, uh, if there's not any significant major bleeding, keeping it clean and free of infection is going to be a huge priority. All right, what's the priority of care for a patient with multi-system trauma? Uh, this is going to be treating the signs and symptoms of shock and keeping them from going into uncompensated shock.